Brody Smith attacking the PDGA? Sounds like a typical Wednesday to me. What's up, Degenerates? I'm Jefferson. Alongside me, the one with all the holes in his game, Swiss Cheese, and we're with the Disc Golf World. 365 days ago, we had 3,000 subscribers, and we are so close to that 20K mark today. It would mean the world to us if you'd smack that subscribe button if you haven't already. We appreciate each and every one of your support, especially with us being on the road. Because of your generosity, we started up the Disc Golf World Patreon, which will have behind-the-scenes content and much more. The link will be in the description below. One of the perks you get for signing up is having your name in every single video. Like this. So if you ever wanted to support us even more, check it out. Big thanks to everyone who already has. You really are the best. But honestly guys, a like and subscribe go a long way. Okay, now back to your regular scheduled Swiss cheese. The issues with the PDGA Live has been frequent this season. No matter how many people try to tell you to wait patiently for the season stat release, growing pains of the app, and lack of DGBT page. Painting those who are simply requesting what has been promised to the fans since Waco as negative or being critical or outspoken. A sentiment that is not often seen from most other professional sports leagues, but for some reason is accepted in ours. The fact that us at the Disc Golf World, along with other content providers and many others, are requesting this information shows the demand by the consumer. Yet they're left in the dark with little to no progress statements, and worse, criticized and painted as negative by others in the community. However, the working parts that have been used have also not been overwhelmingly successful either this year. We have seen the app drop altogether during the Chess.com Invitational, not only affecting the pro tournament, but every tournament taking place at the same time, which for those of you who didn't experience live in person, caused a frantic rush of paper scorecards, halts, and pauses in other tournaments. The excitement of accurate putt measurements from that opening weekend has since faded as the accuracy of distances have been questioned as of late. I have witnessed this myself, following along with cards where inaccurate distances have been recorded in real time at every single event I have attended. Circle 1 putts listed as C2 and 35 footers listed as 55 footers or beyond. Others don't want to discuss the debacle of what just occurred only a couple of weeks ago at the Open at Austin, where the scores needed to be adjusted continually late in the last few holes. Could you imagine looking at the scorecard if you were Antala and it shows insane score jumps as four aces on a par four from the chase card was inputted at one point? Sure, some of those stay positive guys will continue to twist this as a simple mistake that was corrected and he would have known those scores to be inaccurate. Yet expecting a player to decipher that information in a short time while on the course in a professional tournament setting is embarrassing for the sport no matter what spin you want to put on it. By simply putting yourself in Nicholas' shoes, not even the growing pain guys would accept that reasoning with thousands of dollars and a title on the line. The system is reliant on volunteers, coached more so through an informational page than a one-on-one -on -one coaching, and pushed out there in a black vest in a sink or swim fashion resulting in pros often needing to offer assistance for the volunteers who are on the card, which is stand up by those pros. However, asking pros to assist in anything other than their own scorecards, again, delegitimizes the professional nature the tour is trying to promote. It needs to be said, I have seen some great volunteers do an exceptional job. Like a great ref, they don't interject themselves into the action and only record what occurs. But with so many cards, a new system unlike UDIS that most are unfamiliar with, a lack of repeat volunteers for every single day of the event, it has created a mad scramble at tournament points that I've witnessed myself. Only questions the accuracy of the stats, something of which was one of the main reasons Stat Mondo was hired by the PDGA. Even when the community finally gets the season stats, just how accurate of a depiction will it provide? Over half the cards on the first two days didn't have stats inputted at the USWDGC due to a lack of volunteers. That's a major, folks. For any of you who feel I'm just being negative or stirring the pot, there's one universal positive feature that has been celebrated by the pros that the PDGA Live scoring provides. And I'll leave it here for those of you. Whenever there is a scoring discrepancy between the players and volunteers, the app alerts and doesn't allow it to continue till it's resolved forcing all parties to get together and correct it collectively. Sick, right? But a must-needed feature in a professional atmosphere. And in all candid honesty, I've seen some growing pains of that early, but has overall been a success and something the pros have spoken positively about. And if you're now wondering about the pros' thoughts, from the comments I hear on the course, most are similar to that of what Brody expressed. Beth at 69. I just told myself, you've got to will this one in there. Whatever you have, just will it in there. This man, unbelievable. Is he 
is what athletes live for. This is the moment. Brody Smith went to X to make this tweet. Statistics help tell a story, drive a narrative, and ultimately get people more interested in the sport. The fact that we had all of that last year with Udisc Live, and now it seems like we have the dollar version of that with the PDGA, is a big swing and miss. I agree with the Broadster here. Stats drive our storytelling in the recap videos too. It's much more interesting for us to talk about the 50-footer someone hit for birdie rather than just saying they got a bird. Before I get too negative about the app, I'll do my best to try and defend it before I get all the comments saying all I do is complain. I think the basic stats they provide work and help fans back home track what's going on. Well, that's about as much positive as you can squeeze out of me. Especially since we received this message from the DGBT on March 7th, delaying in the stats being on their website that was originally supposed to be available by the start of the season. If only there was some way that could have been avoided. Tennessee 2's DG also mentioned this over on Twitter. Week 4 of complaining about the lack of the DGPT stats platform that was promised by Waco. And while it's truly possible I missed this update on March 7th, I swear it wasn't there when I tweeted about it March 15th when the Open at Austin started, because I checked the website that day. Now I can't confirm if that's true or not. However, they are one of the most reputable accounts over on X, so do with that as you will. Also, we need more disc golfers over there. So go drop Swiss and I a follow, and maybe if you guys bug us enough, we might start using this account again. Before I jump into my thoughts of PDGA Live, let's look at what some other disc golfers had to say on social media to get a grasp of the community's feelings. So off to Reddit, my favorite place for reliable disc golf information. Can't speak for stat keeping side, but since the switch, I've completely stopped following live scores and paying attention to pro events where I used to keep track each week via UDisc. Brody is just saying what people on coverage want to. Even the geese have made several backhanded comments about how stuff isn't available. I've entirely stopped following along live. Unfortunate. These are obviously just a few comments that I saw online and not necessarily the opinion of every disc golfer, but when you start looking at the likes on each post and the replies that make you scroll for days, I think it's safe to say the switch to PDG Live from UDisc is universally not liked. For fair reasoning as well, I'd like to add. This isn't one of those times disc golfers are hating on something new for the sake of it being new. But in the words of Brody Smith, we have the $1 version of an app that made everyone forget about the price increase they were complaining about two months ago. Are we not even going to bring up the fact that there's no more Grip 6 picks of the week? Now I'm sort of joking, because I didn't participate, but there were hundreds of disc golfers competing every single week. Maybe for the prize, but for most, just a deeper way to stay connected to the sport. That's the idea of sports betting. At least until the crippling addiction part starts settling in. But lots of people get into the strangest sports because of the ability to bet on it. That might just be what disc golf needs. Degenerate college students dropping their DoorDash checks on the over of Paul Macbeth's six birdies of the round. Drop a like on the video if you remember disc golf Twitter single-handedly taking out prize picks disc golf betting last year. Cool memory, but ruined disc golf gambling for the rest of us. The other problem I hear non-stop is how slow the app runs. I'm at the event, so I can't give good judgment. However, the few times I do check, I feel like Marty McFly because somehow I'm always watching the future according to PDGA Live. Part of me, though, thinks that's a minor problem because if you're watching live, do you need to see it on the app? And if you aren't watching live, you can't even tell it's slow. One of the positives of the PDGA Live is now the new feature of seeing putting distance instead of the breakdown you just had. It's a great idea in theory. However, when you watch an event in person, you quickly realize the scorekeepers are just guessing on the distances. I don't know if you played with someone who doesn't know what circle 1 is. It's kind of like that. Which is weird because the whiskers show where 10 and 33 feet are, so there should be some better guesses. All I'm saying is, take some of those distances with a grain of salt. This also happened to be the reason you just switched the way they did stats, because fun fact, they used to have the same feature, but got rid of it due to inaccuracy or issues finding stat keepers which was the exact problem we saw this weekend, as not enough volunteers were there to keep stats at U.S. Women's, leaving some players without any stats for the weekend, making Swiss's day one recap really fun. The biggest complaint and what Brody Smith was getting at is no overall season stats. I'm assuming that's why the DGPT hasn't released on their site yet. If you watched our recaps from last year, you would know we love using these stats when breaking down player seasons. Sucks we can't do that right now. I would love to see Evelina's final round putting stats compared to her overall season, but unfortunately we can't do that. There have been plenty of posts online about disc golfers not paying attention to tournaments due to this and other stats not being available anymore. I saw this post on Reddit, and I think it sums up my thoughts perfectly. 
As much growth the sport has seen over the past four years, it has been insane, but compared to other sports, we are still so small. Instead of any more worrying about the monetary value in the future, there needs to be a focus on the greatest quality for the fans possible. Also, there needs to be an investment in the sport, players, and media in order to get the maximum out of fans. As a sport, we can't even get enough people to keep stats for the second biggest women's event of the year. That should be addressed before getting rid of massive parts of the game. Not only for the professional side either, but for all the casuals. How many disc golfers do you know that have U-Disc? I don't know the answer, so I'll just go with a fuck ton. Now, why would we change platforms for the place majority of disc golfers already have on their phone? Especially since the biggest demographic of players are older, and I don't have faith in these people in technology. Also, Steve Hill, a high up in U-Disc and former worker for the PDGA, talks about how only 10% of U-Disc surrounded pro disc golf. In my head, that's perfect for a partnership. An untapped market for the PDGA and the thought of Udis not needing or wanting to expand too much into the professional side. Too bad that didn't happen. And as fans, we are stuck in this position. Hey, if you remember the DGPT kicking Jomez out and bringing them back due to the outcry, maybe the same could happen here. Who am I kidding? There's too much money in this. Just wait until the app you need to keep score in tournament costs $4.99 and don't even get me started on the premium of your personalized stats. Okay, enough on PDGA Live. I don't want you people to think I'm a hater, like Brody. If you listen to Tour Life and somehow still find yourself watching at the hour and a half mark, you would have heard this rant. Basically, Brody talks about what I just did, except then spins it into the worst decision the DGPT has made was aligning themselves with the PDGA, followed with his reasonings for not liking them, and for some reason, the only example he likes bringing up is from 2021 Worlds. Which, hot take, I don't think buying the driving range out was the great move he thinks it was. Think of all the players who weren't able to have the same access to warm up as the later players at the year's biggest tournament. You're telling me if the PDGA bought the driving range after you teed off and let every other player now use it, that you wouldn't have blown them up after the fact. And if you say anything otherwise, that's fucking cap. Next time you want to debate the topic, don't call us out the night of. This was before the disc golf world. Back when Swiss and I sat in front of the fire spin hot takes in the attic of my grandma's house. With mics, I don't even think we knew how to work. Humble beginnings, but pissing Brody off since day one. Hey, he was a fan. Heck yeah, brother. Keep making those videos. I've seen a couple of them. How do we get called out with less than 100 subscribers, but never acknowledged now? Seems weird. All I'm trying to say is you only know one side of the story, and instead of shit-talking the organization behind our sport, maybe let's do a better job at improving it together. Kind of like the DGPT's trying to do. Also to the PDGA, the pros are only 1% of their members. They have over 200,000 other members to worry about. So the partnership with the DGPT makes complete sense. You know, so they can take over the professional side, and then the PDGA won't need a hand in the pro scene. Kind of like Brody wants. Personally, I'm not a current PDGA member, because there's no reason since I don't play in tournaments. We do our growing of the sport through this channel. Until the PDGA learns they need reasons for people like me and Swiss to sign up, I don't see a reason to become a member. You know, since I don't read magazines anymore, I just make a video the day after something happens. A more efficient way to get news across to 20,000 people. Maybe the PDGA should get on that. It'll save some trees too. Texas State starts this weekend, and you already know Swiss and I will be there, so if you see us in our media vests, come say what's up. Even if it looks like we're busy, I promise that just our confused faces. We love meeting you guys in person, so never be afraid to say what's up. If you enjoyed, make sure to like and subscribe. It's the easiest way to support the Disc Golf World while we're on tour. And if you want more bonus content, head over to the Patreon. It's another way to help fund the tour. Oh, and if you want to know the drama that went down to the U.S. Women's Championship, check out the video right here.